Barclays Barclays Eagle Labs event, Transforming Businesses Through Cloud Innovation. I'm Amy Morgan, Eagle Labs Ecosystem Manager for Hull Eagle Lab, and I'm delighted to be joined today by the amazing Stephen Drops, CSO of Codebase, who have run an amazing mentoring sessions to our Eagle Lab members and wider ecosystem. Good morning, Stephen. How are you today? Hi, Amy. I'm very good. Thanks. Good to see you. Good. Lovely to see you too. And we're also joined by Dave Rawl, who's the CTO of Byte, who are one of our very own Hull Eagle Lab members who are experts in cloud optimization. He's going to share his amazing insights today. How are you doing, Dave? I'm all right, Amy, and uh, good morning, everybody. Good to hear. So just before we start, we do need to run through a little bit of housekeeping. So firstly, a quick disclaimer from Eagle Labs. So today we've asked Stephen and Dave to join us to provide some tips and tricks on innovation and transformation using cloud technology. The topics discussed are an overview of options for you to think about how to help you with your independent research and business decisions. So aren't intended as recommendations or advice. Remember as well that your business has its own individual circumstances. The statements and views expressed may not be applicable or suitable for your business. We'd love this session to be super interactive and we'll be hosting a Q&A with Stephen and Dave towards the end of the session. In the YouTube description box below, there will be a link to VBOX, our Q&A platform. So please fire across any questions, comments, and we'll try and get through as many as possible towards the end of the session. So that's all over. Without further ado, I'll hand over firstly to Stephen. Stephen, welcome, over to you. Thanks, Amy. Hi, everyone. Uh, you should be able to see my screen now and see some slides, is that right? Yeah, got them. Cool, great. So, um, well, first of all, thanks everyone for coming today. It's uh, really kind of you. I know everyone's time is very precious. Um, we're talking a little bit about um, software today, a little bit about the cloud, and I just wanted to go through a bunch of kind of wider thoughts um, on, on that space, a bunch of kind of strategic um, thinking and to see if it's applicable to your businesses. Um, please uh, feel free to click on the VBOX link below if you have any questions. Um, and also, um, you might have a link on your emails as well that you've received. So um, any questions at all, uh, please feel free to, to fire them across. Cool. So um, a tiny, tiny bit about Codebase I'll be talking about today, a tiny bit about myself. Um, then I'll be talking about uh, a big sort of catchphrase that's used in the VC world, um, which is that software is eating the world. I'll talk a tiny bit about what that means, or what the consequences are of software eating the world. Um, then I'll talk about a thing called cohort theory, um, which is about how software is pushing things to the cloud. And I'll talk about that cohort theory piece um, with regards to replicating things and enabling new things. Uh, and then I'll talk about how enabling things is a kind of really interesting cross, cross cohort opportunity for growth and collaboration. And, um, and I think, I hope with that, um, I, I'll be teeing up the next speaker. So. Cool. All right. I'm going to start then. Um, so Codebase, very briefly, uh, we're just over seven years old now. Um, we're the largest tech incubator in the UK, one of the largest in Europe. Um, we've grown like crazy. Then COVID struck, <laughs> but um, but we're, we're, we're still growing, strangely. Uh, we've got um, over 100 tenant companies um, across three locations, um, a whole bunch of space, um, and those companies have raised cumulatively over the time, uh, just north of uh, $600 million. Um, we're not just a space place. Uh, we're not just a tenancy place. We're also an educational institution. We work uh, closely with Barclays and uh, with University of Edinburgh uh, to name just but two partners. Um, myself, um, just a mercifully uh, short <laughs> introduction. Um, I I've been a founder twice. Uh, with one exit uh, and one failure. Uh, the failure took about five years to happen. I wish it had taken about three, uh, but there you go. I've been at Codebase and I run strategy at Codebase uh, for the last five years. Um, the things I'm really interested in are uh, strategy, partnerships, uh, startups, and corporate transformation, how all these things kind of hang together. And today, I'd like to give you a, just a quick uh, sort of insight as to what that kind of stuff could look like and how it plays into the real world. Okay, so the first cornerstone of, of thinking uh, for me is always to return to 
um, the adage that software is eating the world. Now, what does that mean? Um, it's a phrase that was uh, taken from a, an essay written in 2011 by a guy called Mark Andreessen. For those of you who don't know, Mark Andreessen is a, a kind of legendary venture capitalist. Uh, of the, he's a partner in the firm Andreessen Horowitz. Um, Mark Andreessen, though, um, as an entrepreneur, um, uh, created uh, Netscape um, back in the day. So the very first web browser. So an absolute pioneer of the web and of the software world. And uh, the phrase he came up with in 2011, software is eating the world, basically refers to the fact that whatever workflow we have nowadays, whatever life flow, frankly, software has been injected into it. Software is eating part of that world. So whether it be how we order food, how we um, find out where we can go on holiday, how we, we book tickets, how we play games, how we find the loves of our lives, uh, how we order transport, how we work, et cetera, et cetera, that whatever thing we can think of, software has been injected into it, has eaten part of that. And um, the, the ultimate expression of that is that whatever software hasn't eaten yet, it will eat next. Um, so education, healthcare, uh, whatever we can think of, whatever life moment we have, software is gonna be there. And um, and this software in the world has led to a few kind of big consequences. And I would like to go through those now. So the first one um, is that the things are speeding up. All sorts of aspects of life are getting faster and faster. Um, parallel to that, the things that are, are bubbling up and, and, and becoming new and, and more and more quickly are also um, living shorter and shorter lifespans. Um, the third piece is that we now have the development of mega platforms of basically new big pieces of rent seeking infrastructure. And the fourth piece is that we have massive disruption. So things are changing. So the fact that we've got all those um, four things happening at the same time means the world is changing very, very quickly. I'll go into those bits um, individually now. So I love this graph. It's from uh, a guy called Horace Deju. Um, super, super smart. Uh, really, uh, uh, you would like to recommend that you, you follow him on Twitter. Very, very, very clever. Um, and the chart you can see here basically shows um, how uh, the adoption rates of different technologies go historically. Um, and you can see things on the on the very left, like the stove that took you know about hundred and somewhat years to be adapted, adopted. Uh, the telephone, the fixed line phone, the same thing. Radio, dishwashers, etc. Refrigerators, they all take a long time. And as we come up to the now period, as that's on the on the on the, the right of the graph, we can see that new technologies, the adoption rates of them, happen faster and faster and faster. And the big green tunnel in the middle is human beings' life expectancies. So we're in a world where we're living longer and longer and longer, and there's more and more stuff happening during our lifetimes. Um, Clever Clogs economists say uh, that those graphs are starting to go vertical. So, you know, if you look at the, the, the cell phone adoption was 100 times faster than the fixed line adoption, and the smartphone adoption was 10 times faster than the cell phone adoption, et cetera. So things are getting faster and faster and faster. We truly live in a world of acceleration, again, powered by software. Uh, the next point is shorter lifespans. This is another favorite um, chart of mine because um, it's easy to remember. If you look at the average lifespan of an S&P 500 index company in the 60s, it was roughly 60 years. And 2021, it's roughly 20 years. It's actually below that now. I think it's like 18 years or so. Um, so this means, you know, big companies are, are, are living shorter and shorter lives and new companies are bubbling up, grabbing a whole bunch of market and then disappearing again. So lots and lots of movement, lots of things happening uh, again and again, faster and faster. Um, mega platforms, I, I, I kind of struggle to show some evidence for this um, because I think many of us know this intuitively. We, if we think about Google or Facebook or Twitter or Uber or you know what, whatever thing we can think of, very often it's a winner takes all or winner takes most um, new kind of reality. Um, and I, I just thought this this Twitter exchange was was super interesting. That you can see that roughly forty three percent of all venture capital goes into Facebook and Google ads, 
I mean, that's a, you know, that's an incredible statistic, um, and it shows you how how big those uh, mega platforms are, and and how much they they capture the market, and they're kind of self feeding, um, ever bigger getting kind of um, behemoth. Um, so the next piece then is disruption, um, and for disruption, there's, there's again many, many, many ways to 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 visualize this or to to give evidence for this. Uh, this chart I thought was was very salient, and it because it basically just shows um, the amount of ecosystems globally that have produced a billion dollar startup. So a billion dollar startups very often called a, a unicorn. Uh, unicorns are startups that achieve a billion dollar valuation um, within ten years. Okay, so that means they're mostly uh, companies that are building some kind of product and, and that within 10 years, they got a billion dollar valuation. Now, initially those companies were restricted to San Francisco and the Valley, uh, but now we have uh, 80 ecosystems globally. Now, a bunch of those ecosystems can all be in the same country. Many, many, many of them are in the U US, um, but more and more now we have this world where there are new companies bubbling up all over the world uh, that are getting those billion dollar valuations. And that means that different ecosystems throughout the planet are getting more and more mature and learning more and more and uh, understanding the game more and more. Um, and, and, we, and we see this, this happen. Um, and this leads to massive disruption because as those companies grow, they start to sort of overtake the, uh, the incumbent world uh, and they start to you know, become big employers, et cetera. One, one example would be in, in Edinburgh, there's a company called Skyscanner um, and they've got, I don't even know, I think they've got like 2,000 or so employees. Uh, and, and as they're growing, um, they are a unicorn. Um, you can see that they become, you know, they start to eat into the kind of image of Edinburgh as purely a kind of um, banking um, city uh, that employs thousands of people or tens of thousands of people in banking. That's still the case, but you can see these, these, these startups starting to eat into that and starting to, to disrupt that status quo. Okay, going to the next slide. Um, this is what uh, I call cohort theory. And uh, cohort theory basically just states that there are different kinds of companies in the world today. Um, and you can group them into not verticals or not, not industry types, but instead when they were born with regards to the advent of software. And I've, for the purpose of today's conversation, I've interchanged the word software with servers. Um, but you, you hopefully get the point, it's the, it's the same kind of space. So you'll have a bunch of cohort zero companies. So that's companies that were born before there were software, before there were servers, so they were born with no server. Then there's a bunch of companies um, that were born as servers came about and those servers and that computing that they did was all on premise. They had big boxes or a big room uh, full, of, full of tin and, 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 and server hosting uh, where that worked. And that was a whole massive industry. Then you've got cohort two companies. Those are uh, companies are born as the web was born and, and they're shifting their servers into the cloud. So, um, you know, part of the really interesting thing is if you look at the, the, the kind of poster kid um, companies of, of that cohort that came about as the, as the web came about, they now are the kind of infrastructure of the web. So if you look at Google hosting services or Amazon, um, you, can, you can see that the AWS is obviously a, a huge behemoth in that world now. Um, then the most recent companies we have are actually very often called born in the cloud companies. Uh, that means they, they've they never had any on-prem uh, servers. Uh, their, their sort of normal uh, was to, to, uh, to obviously just build on AWS or, or Google or, or Azure or whoever it may be. Um, so what this looks like, um, the way it plays out for uh, for companies in a, in, a, in, a, in a zoomed out level for looking at um, the way things are going, is that the older cohorts, so remember cohorts like Walmart, Volkswagen, Boeing, etc., when they used computers, what they were doing was they were replicating things they already knew. And I love this ad, it's from the early 80s and it's describing how email works. And if you look at the guy, he's, he, you know, he knows how to write a letter or send us something, uh, but he's sort of magically, electronically receiving mail at his desk. I mean, the, the really groovy thing is that, that desk doesn't feature a computer. So, uh, so, so the early, early so software efforts were about replicating things you already did, and then you know, adding the word electronic or 
something like that in front of it and saying, this is a new thing. Um, but newer cohorts um, are not just replicating things, they're just enabling new things. So this is um, from the pitch deck. If you're those startup people amongst you will know these things. Uh, this is from the pitch deck that um, Uber built. Uh, and, it, and it's really interesting because you can see that shift from enabling, uh, sorry, from, from replicating to enabling. If you look at Uber, it used to be known as Uber Cab when they started pitching. So they very much were still kind of, okay, we're an electric cab or we're an internet cab. Um, uh, very clearly showing that the phone, though, is not replicating the car. The, the, the car is replicating the cab, but the phone is enabling a whole bunch of new stuff. And if you look to the right-hand side, you can see that that enabling is based strongly on uh, Google Maps in this case. Uh, uh, so, so Google Maps has become a, 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 an obvious part of the infrastructure that something like Uber will use. Uh, and, and to the point where they just, you know, have a bullet point that says Google Maps integration, because by that time, everyone knows what Google Maps is, everyone knows uh, what it enables, everyone knows that it's part of your smartphone experience. Um, so this newer parts of technology, not really replicating a map, but instead enabling new things uh, on, to, on top of this. Um, a further um, sort of bit of evidence or, or data for um, the power of enabling, uh, and for disruption, frankly, is to look at this uh, graph um, that shows how fintech, how the sort of big incumbents uh, within fintech are um, buying or, 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 or going into um, the startup world and, and, and putting, placing those startups around them to enable, frankly, their, their continuation to exist, right? So if, if they're struck by this massive disruption in those startups eating away at what they do, what can you do? Well, one thing you can do is you can you can actually buy those companies, and this will show you how the major banks have invested uh, in startups over, over the years to sort of maintain their maintain their position. So we have this world where we've got software powering a whole bunch of changes. Uh, those changes playing out in investment, in disruption, in lots of different ways, um, tagging things together, uh, and and all of that um, being pushed onto the cloud. Um, that, that's me. Um, the, the, the big thing I'd like to um, leave you guys with is that um, looking at the, at the cloud um, means that we um, have the opportunity to take the very, very early stage things and the very, very incumbent things and give them a platform and a place where they can actually connect, where they can connect and work together. And by doing that, create new opportunities for each other. Um, so that's the importance, I think, of, of the new kind of infrastructure we have in the cloud, that we can build on a, a very robust and um, innovative infrastructure. But that infrastructure doesn't just allow you to do things faster, which is really groovy if you're a startup, but it also allows you to connect with existing businesses, not just the big mega banks, but also SMEs, uh, companies who've been kind of replicating what they used to do offline, online. Um, it allows startups to go into that space, uh, connect with those companies, and build new opportunities together. And uh, yeah, I'll I'll finish at that point. Um, thanks for listening. Amazing, thanks, Stephen. And just echoing everything you've mentioned in your presentation, you know, Eagle Labs is very much at the heart of collaborating those startups with the SMEs, with the corporates, um, and enhancing those connections. Um, enhancing collaboration so everybody that's attending today if that's something that you'd like to know more about please do visit our website at labs.uk.barclays um, and speak to your local ecosystem manager we do have 25 labs across the uk and we'd love to understand how we can look to support you whether it's through the cloud optimization but also through the connectivity piece and um, it's something that we're really passionate about for the uk entrepreneurial ecosystem so thank you Stephen. that was amazing um, if anybody does have any questions, please do pop them into the V box whilst they're fresh on your mind, and we'll answer them at the end towards the Q and A. Um, and I'd like to welcome Dave onto his presentation now from Bytes. Thank you. Thanks very much, Amy. Um, so if I can have my slides up, please. That'd be fantastic. So. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for being here today. Uh, you know, everybody is very busy, so your time is really appreciated. Um, I'm going to rattle through some parts of this quite quickly. Um, uh, to, to make sure that we can spend time on what hopefully is the interesting bit. So first things first, um, who am I? 
Uh, my name's David Rawl. I'm the um, group CTO here at Bytes Technology Group in the UK. And I've been working now for, for over 20 years in the IT security industry. And, and throughout that time, I've kind of had what I refer to as a unique perspective. It's, it's probably not unique, but uh, it certainly brings something very uh, useful to any meeting, any collaboration we have, which is I started off as a, as a lowly little network analyst um, for a biomedical research company um, back in the, the late 90s. So I was an end user. Um, I then made the jump to security partnerships as it was then um, as a consultant. Uh, and in that time, I progressed from consultant to being a manager of technical services and delivery. Um, and I became a director and joint MD of that company when it was bought by Bytes in 2011. Um, and um, as um, the joint MD of that business effectively took the, the business owner role of, of, of leading that business and, and enabling technology within that business. So I've, I've seen all of the aspects and, and it was very interesting um, uh, listening uh, to Stephen's presentation about rapid adoption, all that kind of thing, because I've, I've seen a lot of that change. You know, I remember deploying email into an organization in, in the late 90s. You know, a few people had email, a few people didn't. Deploying the internet for the first time, providing internet to the desktop, you know, things that people completely take for granted now. And it, it was interesting in, in a lot of ways, maybe, maybe more interesting, less technically advanced, but maybe more interesting because it was genuinely new things back then. Um, across that 20 years, I'm, I'm very unusual. I think I've worked for the same organization and, and that's the business that was originally security partnerships, became Byte Security Partnerships and it is now the security division of, of Byte Software Services. Just to give you an idea of, of kind of some of the milestones, we're a 100 million pound business now. I'll skip through this fairly fast. Um, we are a full forensics and incident response business. Um, so we can do your PCI uh, auditing, we can do your pen testing, and we can deal with any incidents and forensics problems that you may have. It has to be said this year or, or the last 12 months really as a result of the new normal have been absolutely unprecedented in terms of some of the challenges our customers have been facing. Um, and we support the complete life cycle of, 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 of security. But that it's all very interesting, but it doesn't really touch on what I'm here to talk about today. It's just kind of the quick introduction to Bytes just to give you an idea of where we are. But this I just wanted to dwell on for a second. This is um, something that some of you may have seen before. Um, it's a slide that's produced by Momentum Cyber and they call it their Cyberscape slide. This is the 2021 version of it. And there's a lot of vendors on here. There's a lot of technology on here. So forget it, this is just the IT security landscape. And this is the minefield that end users, that our customers have to try and, and work their way through when they're making decisions about how to apply technology uh, within their business and what are the right choices and the wrong choices. Now you'll see some obviously overlap of logos here because some of these vendors participate in multiple areas, but, but let's be clear, our industry is, is crazy in terms of its complication. IT, uh, IT security, cloud, uh, infrastructure, all of these different areas are, are just ridiculously complicated now. And like I said, this is just a snapshot from a, a security point of view. So what do I know about the cloud? Um, I mean, Stephen's done a great job of kind of teaming me up to talk about cloud and actually implementation, some of the challenges that, that we work with our customers on. Um, hopefully I'm not teaching you all to suck eggs, but I think sometimes these things are a question of perspective. Um, so let's start here, uh, as I said on site. If you're working from the office, um, there's a word missing there. But if you're working from uh, um, from home, um, then the office is a cloud. Okay, so if you're working at home, then the office is a cloud from your point of view. It might be um, a piece of infrastructure that is solely on-premise. But if you're at home and your exchange, your business runs on-premise exchange servers and on-premise file servers, and you're connecting over traditional VPN, that is your cloud. Okay, so we have to be clear on that. The cloud is effectively a computing resource that is not local to you, you know, but it is rawest definition. Um, if you're in the office or if you're out and about using your mobile phone or using your laptop or using your tablet, I don't know who uses laptops when they're out and about these days, um, then your home might be a personal cloud. A lot of people are looking for ways and grasping at ways of taking their data away from Google or Facebook. Um, I see a real surge of interest in people looking to run private infrastructure to store their photos and, and things like that because they don't want that data harvesting. It's still a cloud, 
um, you know, there, there are articles, you see, this was, this was last year, um, but there are articles that are, are updated and created all the time, expressly devoted for hobbyists, people who are into technology, which um, are probably a, a fair number of you on this session are trying to create your own version of Google Photos or, or things like that so that you can have the privacy but still have the functionality. But for me, cloud is, is merely, for one of a better description, remote computing resource. Okay, that's all it is. And if you're in the office, then it might be something at home. And if you're at home, then your office is a cloud. Um, it's not what people think of as cloud though. Um, I say, it isn't what we think cloud is. That's not what we believe cloud is. We would treat cloud as, as potentially any one of these things here that I've got on the screen. And I would imagine that, that most businesses here are consuming at least one of these, even if it's just software as a service. You know, Salesforce is software as a service. Uh, Microsoft 365 is software as a service. Amazon Desktop is software as a service. G Suite, software as a service. You know, these are all as a service platforms. I think where a lot of businesses started with storage, they would do maybe offsite backups into uh, something like uh, Amazon EC2, EC3, et cetera. Um, a lot of businesses jumped on the Amazon Glacier um, route when that first appeared because it was a very good way of storing large quantities of data a long term that you felt you wouldn't be likely to need. Software as a service has, has been around really in some form or another for as long as I can remember. But then we start moving into platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, uh, and how important these are to businesses now and, and in the way they work. A lot of customers I talk to are using cloud for their disaster recovery. They no longer have a physical DR site or space at a data center. Uh, they're using AWS or, or Azure as their disaster recovery. And then we move on into, into some of the really cool stuff where we're doing function-based work in the cloud. We're deploying microservices for rapid scaling. And of course, underpinning all of that is, is the concept of guaranteed uptime. Um, guaranteed isn't the same as 100%. I think we have to be very, very clear on that. You know, um, a lot of businesses think and said that, that guaranteed uptime means 100% uptime and they're not the same thing. You have an uptime guarantee uh, with your providers and I bet you it's not 100% and I bet you they meet all of the tick boxes. Doesn't help you as an end user if your email goes down or if some of your infrastructure goes down and they just go, but with it within SLA. But um, I think it's worth pointing out that a lot of businesses think they have 100% uptime from the cloud. They don't, they have guaranteed uptime. So the reality is somewhere between the two. The reality is somewhere between your office being a cloud and um, you know, a, a pure cloud service. That's what the cloud means. It's somewhere between the two. Um, so what I wanna do now is just talk about a couple of case studies um, where I have worked with um, customers uh, and been directly involved with some solutions that, that we have put forward for customers. Cause I think they shine a light on what cloud can mean and, 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 and what software can mean, et cetera. And as you said, software is eating the world. So I was asked to, to attend a meeting, I was asked to get involved in a call with an end user because they had a, uh, a device management project as they described it to us. They wanted to get involved with device management um, and they wanted to um, put a, a wrap of device management around their laptops and, and their end user devices. But we very quickly realized that wasn't what they were trying to achieve. What they were actually trying to achieve was a consistent approach for home workers and office workers, in fact, all workers. So they wanted the end user experience to be the same, whether a user was opening the lid of a laptop, whether they were using a desktop PC on a hot desk in an office, uh, whether they were connecting off an iPad as an exec, uh, or a tablet, if I'm being more uh, manufacturer generic, a tablet and remote working. They actually, what they were seeking was a consistent approach to working. They didn't have a, a device management project. They were trying to seek that. And actually that met, turned it into a cloud project. And in fact, a hybrid cloud project. So what uh, the, the final design was, and to give you maybe some more ideas, was, um, uh, uh, a hybrid of their on-premise hosted virtual desktop environment, but also created in a way where it could be replicated into a cloud hosted virtual desktop environment. And, and you can do this with any provider uh, as it happens. Uh, this was a Microsoft based solution, but this could be Amazon. This could be Google cloud. This could be any provider uh, in terms of how you would achieve this. Um, 
and what by combining the underpinning uh, device management and provisioning tools with the synchronization tools that are available as part of the platform, what this business was able to achieve by utilizing a hybrid cloud approach was to ensure that wherever a user logged in and whenever that user logged in, they had their documents there, their desktop looked and smelled the same, the performance was the same. And it really didn't matter what they did. So the environment, the security, and the functionality was the same. And I think this is the bit where it's quite interesting for me. The end user experience was great. This is what they wanted to achieve. But by doing it, the business also had the comfort blanket of knowing that the security and the underpinning functionality was the same for every end user. So it didn't matter if there, there was no chinks in the armor when a user connected because we were providing the same end user experience. Um, very much a hybrid cloud solution. This, as, as an example, very much a, a pure cloud solution. I think we all know as a result of um, the new normal, unprecedented times, all the cliches you want to use of, of the last 12 months, that the hospitality sector here in the UK uh, has in particular been absolutely decimated. Um, it, it, it's just been a terrible, terrible time for them. And some of the challenges that they've had have, have been unique and actually through kind of, if you like, uh, some really innovative thinking, businesses have been able to provide, and, and this is not just us, but this is, is the partner community, have been able to, to provide our customers some really, really clever solutions. And it's not even about rapid scaling, although that's the phrase here. The, the important thing is dormant. So when a business has its doors shut, because we're in the terrible situation of being locked down, they are spending no money on infrastructure, literally no money. Then when they open up, and we go through this at the moment, you know, we are available for outside hospitality at the moment. We can't go inside. That restricts numbers. Weather restricts numbers. You know, if it's chucking it down with rain, it's freezing cold, like it seems to be every other day at the moment. Can't remember when we've had this many, many run of frosts. Um, they need a very small amount of capacity because they might be running a, a table booking system or something like that. But their whole infrastructure needs to be small. It needs to be very low level. It needs to be very low cost to optimize their running costs and, and, their, and their current situation. But then hopefully, May the 17th, we can all go inside. We can have meet inside in pubs from group, in groups of six. And suddenly, overnight, that infrastructure needs to scale. Now, Cloud, function-based and, and microservice-based solutions are uniquely suitable for this. We now have the ability to create infrastructure for customers that it, it's not even a question of like turning half of it off when you don't need it. It's dormant. If we get closed down, it's dormant. It costs no money or a very, very small amount of money. And without you having to do anything, as you wake up tills, as you wake up scanners, as people are hitting websites with apps on their phones to place orders for, for food and drink, it is dynamically scaling in the background. You know, you accept that a certain percentage of your cost um, is the cost of running that infrastructure. You know, so you, you put 10p on a pint, you put 10p on a pint of Diet Coke, you put 10p on a meal, because in reality, that's the addition of your cost. And you know it's not going to sting you, because as your business scales up, that 10p scales up in terms of the quantity of orders and it covers the costs of the infrastructure. It's a very, very unique business model. And it's something we could never have done, even possibly 10 years ago. We couldn't have done this. And this calls out to what Stephen said about these vertical adoption lines. We are innovating now at such a fast pace. We're innovating in a, an incredibly flexible and rapid way. Multi-cloud. Multi-cloud seems to be a, a hot topic. Hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, whatever you want to call it. I mean, if I go back to the, these two case studies, this one is, is definitely hybrid cloud from my point of view. This one, do you know what? Would you make it multi-cloud if you put all your eggs in one basket and you do your design purely on one cloud provider and that cl cloud provider has an outage, your business is shut down. So you might well want to move into multi-cloud. You want resilience. So what about multi-cloud environments? Well, first thing for me, if you've got an on-premise, if you've got even so much as one server in a rack, that's supporting, and that might be uh, your Active Directory server and you're running uh, as your AD, but you've got an on-premise Active Directory server as part of it. That is a hybrid cloud environment by definition. So, you know, you're already in that boat uh, and a multi-cloud. But if you're going multi-cloud and, and if you've got a leg on-prem and you've got more than one cloud provider, you really, your, your level of complexity and the level of effort you need to put into what you're doing needs to, to be exponentially higher. Because although 
uh, the, the end result of, of say building 50% of your infrastructure in Azure and 50% of your infrastructure in AWS is the same. And although the functionality um, is similar in terms of what you can achieve, the way that you do it, the product knowledge that you need to run those clouds and run those infrastructures is different. It's fundamentally different. Um, and because of that, there's a lot of mistakes that can be made in configuration. You know, we have a lot of stats being bandied around in the security industry at the moment by Ghana. They're saying 98% of security breaches over the next five years will be caused by misconfiguration. Now, about you, personally, I feel that a large element of that will be businesses stretching themselves too thin in terms of product knowledge and not knowing the infrastructures they're deploying into well enough, particularly if they're doing multi-cloud, and that will catch them out. And a GDPR fine, I mean, I don't know anybody who's had a 4% of global revenue fine yet, but it could be 4% of revenue if you are shown to have been cavalier or callous in the way that you have designed your infrastructure uh, and, and in the way you've implemented. So these different clouds need different product knowledge. And, and if you're making mistakes um, with those different areas of product knowledge, it can cause you a, a really, really big problem. So I think it, it's key that you, if you want to go multi-cloud, I would never advise against it because no cloud provider has 100% uptime. They have guaranteed service. As I said earlier, that's different. You have to be thinking about the product knowledge uh, that you have across those clouds and how you are making sure you're doing everything right in all of them. So that goes on to the question, what can we do to help? Um, and, and for me, uh, what can Bytes do to help? And you could cross out Bytes and put any partner worth their salt. It's our job to challenge you. It is our, chol uh, our, jo our, cholum? our challenge uh, and our job to make sure that we are pushing you as end users to make sure you're making good decisions. We need to bring all of the available technology to you and we need to have a two-way conversation with you about what you're trying to achieve. There are too many partners out there that frankly are preying on the massive layer of complexity in the marketplace. I mean, I showed you that slide earlier that showed the number of security vendors are out there alone. They're preying on the level of complexity. They're allowing end users to make mistakes because when an end user make a mistake, makes a mistake or an end user is fearful of an audit or of a situation they find themselves in, unfortunately, they end up spending more money than they need to. Um, spend, value, cost, they're all very different things. It's our job to challenge you on your thinking, to make sure you the best choice, make the best choices to get the most value out of what you're doing and your business can, can move forward in the most flexible and productive way and the most innovative way. Um, that's about me. I think I'm pretty much on time. Um, we as Bytes have a, a quick code here where you can um, grab an Apple Watch of us if you uh, go into the draw and win. We do capture a little bit of information, but it's all spelled out on the website what we're capturing. Um, scan the code, put your details in, and we'll enter you in. I know this session gets recorded, um, and, and as a result, some of you will be watching this maybe a week, two weeks, a month uh, in the future. We're going to keep this link live for a week, so it'll be uh, live until the end of the day on the 13th of May. And I think that is about me, um, Amy. I'm done. Thanks so much, Dave. It's really great to see the case studies and it come to life of how we can use cloud, you know, to adopt it and use it in different businesses um, and also different business structures, you know, from the startup right through to the corporates. Um, we are going to kick off the Q&A session now, but just leading into that, I've just got a good question for you, Dave, and there is already a question for you, Steve, on the VBOX. Um, so I'll kick off with these two questions first, but everyone, please drop um, a line in or any comments or questions you've got as we go along, um, and I'll moderate through the questions and we'll hopefully get to answer all of them for you. Um, so the first question we've got, so you mentioned, Dave, around rapid scaling. So imagine a lot of high growth businesses use cloud optimization to be able to continue the developments of the software to make sure they're meeting the customer requirements. But I was just wondering, what is the biggest challenge with corporates adopting cloud innovation? Um, the biggest challenge, I think, is, is it's going to sound really trite, but it's, it's their ambition uh, and their imagination, really. Um, so that's the first challenge, because a lot of businesses don't think about the possible. They just think about what they know, and they try and replicate what they already have into the cloud, which is not the right answer. You have to start again and think afresh to make the best use of the cloud. You know, just picking a server up and putting it into the cloud is not the best use of that infrastructure. It's definitely the most cost effective way uh, of putting that infrastructure. 
Uh, so it's it's really the biggest challenge is thinking out of the box and, and reinventing yourself for a new infrastructure rather than just replicating what you're doing and finding people to give you good advice on that. For me, Amy, that's the biggest challenge for corporates. Amazing. Thank you. Uh, Stephen, we've just got a quick question for yourself. So, hi, Stephen. What hi. do you think are some of the barriers to enterprises where they are fully aware that they need to innovate and adopt software but are reluctant to do so? Do you think it's emotional or a mental barrier or lack of know-how? Well, that's a great question and it kind of follows on from, from Dave's answer a little bit. Um, so I think it's a cultural question, really, at the end of the day. There's an old, um, another, sorry, I'm full of those adages. Um, there's another old adage that says, uh, culture beats strategy. Um, and I think it's a, it's a culture question within a large organization to be open to not just sort of replicate what you've done offline um, or, or what you've done with an existing IT structure, but instead try to work out what are the new possibilities, what are the new things you can do um, to, to create a, a, a new environment. Then the difficulty there is that um, very often if you're a large enterprise, you've incentivized people, frankly, to be really great at what they do um, within an existing un well understood paradigm. And it's about delivery and polishing and, and making the existing better and better and better. But the, the danger of disruption means that um, if you focus too much on delivering the thing you already know, you just miss all these new opportunities on the other side. And if the world's getting faster and faster and faster, there's a trade off um, that you really need to, to, to investigate very clearly. And I, I would argue there's more and more opportunities on this new new space than on maintaining the old in a, in a, in a nicer way. Um, that's a fairly kind of basic message. It's not really hard to understand. I, I think the challenge is having an internal culture that can be open to that message and open to um, understanding how to make those shifts um, and how to do it is is really hard. So there's, there's a bunch of playbooks on this, um, but they're not that well known um, because people are reluctant to move. Um, people don't really get to experiment that much and fail and, and do it better next time. So those are the kinds of challenges I think that are the biggest. Yeah, definitely. And the playbooks are always really useful. I've listened to a few of them um, and the insights that you get from them are all its first hand experience, but also opens up your eyes um, to a much wider view um, on how you can look to adopt the culture. So that's a great shout. If anybody wants to know anything more about the playbooks, please reach out. Um, yeah, I mean, oh, sorry. I, I, I just think uh, the, the, just to, to anchor on the playbooks angle for a second, the interesting thing about playbooks is that the, there are corporate playbooks, but mostly playbooks as a metaphor comes from the startup world. And I think we're in a place now where imagine if you look at venture capitalists, like proper, you know, experienced VCs, most of them are ex founders of startups. So they've learned a whole bunch of stuff. And when they invest money next time around, um, they'll, they'll look to try and not just bring money to the table, but also bring expertise. And the way that expertise is distilled and played forward is via a playbook. Um, so if, in a sense, um, VCs are almost like theoretical physicists talking to applied physicists to do experiments. And as they do experiments, some of them work, some of them don't. And But each time they do something, you can work out what worked, distill it into a playbook and then go forward and go forward and go forward. So that means that the startup world is this massive experiment of iteration and the lessons of that iteration are learned by the investors and founders codified in these books. And then you go again and, and, and you know, hope to learn more. If you're a large corporation and you're not part of that, that means that your speed of understanding the world is, is much delayed and much slowed down. So, you know, it'd be really um, interesting for incumbent companies to to hang out with startups to, to engage with them in some way um, to see how these fast new moving things can happen so they can learn and adopt those playbooks yeah definitely and I do think it is very much in this new world I've certainly seen taken on the role as ecosystem manager the collaboration between the corporates and the startups it's making those corporate businesses think like a startup but then also allowing startups to have the opportunity to work with those larger corporates and yeah. the collaboration um, and the effect of that afterwards is so amazing to see. You know, you can see the benefit from both types of businesses and it's so, so crucial. Um, yeah. It's so, so useful as well. 
Fab. Just before I read out uh, the next question that we've got, I just wanted to make you all aware of that NPS link that's also on the VBOX chat that the host has kindly put in there. Um, it's really, really important to us and um, we would love for you to be able to hit the link and answer a couple of questions around today's event just so we can look to put on events in the future that are relevant to our ecosystems, make sure we're bringing the best speakers that we can source from our connections um, and just make sure that the events we're putting on are really, really relevant and effective to your business and your growth. So we'd really appreciate any feedback you'd be able to provide by clicking the link in the VBOX chat. That would be amazing. And just to remind you, if you need to um, click on the VBOX, there is a link just underneath the YouTube video as well. So another question that's come through. So how easy is it for large corporates like Barclays to transition over to the cloud when they have legacy processes and systems in place which haven't been plugged into the cloud? And does it give an advantage to challenge your organisations who have been using cloud services since day one? Who, did you want both? Who, who, do you want both of us to pitch in an answer on that, Amy? Who would who'd you like to go first? <laughs> Probably yourself, Dave, I think maybe more uh, more relevant just with the work that Bytes has been doing with the recent case studies. I, I think it's it's a very interesting question. You know, you've you've got a long standing legacy set up. Um, it, I mean, in some cases, for, for I mean, you, you you sounded out Barclays as a specific example. So a lot of it isn't even going to be internet facing. It's it's not as if it's even a cloud infrastructure. It probably isn't even connected to the internet for safety. Some of that infrastructure, and. You know, the, the concept of, you know, for instance, taking cash points around the country, you know, rather than get cash points being connected on a private network, let's just connect them to a local internet link and bring it back over the cloud to cloud infrastructure. And then, you know, if it's a bank holiday or a Sunday and nobody's using the cash points, we don't need to run the infrastructure and it can scale up. It sounds amazing, but doing it in a way that is secure, doing it in a way that works for businesses is really challenging. And, you know, there are no easy answers to it, unfortunately. I wish there was a magic wand. Sometimes you, you have to accept and, and use to, to use a phrase of our group CISO, you have to just look at your old infrastructure and, and, and either term it as legacy or pre-loved and go, do you know what? I'm just going to put that in a box. I'm going to leave it behind and I'm going to build new. I'm, I'm not actually going to worry about migrating because actually that old legacy infrastructure works. I'm just not going to do anything new with it. And every new business challenge, I'm going to look out the box and I'm going to try and do it in a different way. And, and I suppose if I were to give anybody advice, it would be don't get too hung up on moving things that work into the cloud. If it works, it works, leave it where it is. Do different things in the cloud. You know, one of the things that came to mind when Stephen was, was answering the last question from me was, you know, the definition of insanity is just doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. If you just move infrastructure into the cloud, you won't achieve anything different. In fact, you'll probably increase your costs you know, rather than decrease them and you'll, you'll decrease your flexibility rather than increase it. You've got to do different things. So I guess that a very, very long way of answering that question, I'd be tempted to just leave the old stuff behind and do new innovation in the cloud. And then in 10 years time, you'll look back and you'll go, we've migrated to the cloud, but in a really innovative and creative way. Yeah, I think that's a great answer, Dave. Um, and to add to it from a, from a startup perspective, um, I think we all know B2C companies and B2B companies, but from a startup perspective, there are now more and more B2D companies and B2D means business to developer. So things like Twilio or Stripe, you know, big kind of, you know, you know, I think Stripe's got over a hundred billion dollar valuation now. Um, and, and, and I just think it's a huge opportunity for startups to germinate around helping people like yourselves or helping startups by creating, you know, great solutions that are that are um, super tight around certain problem sets or certain challenges. Um, so if you're a startup, um, and it's, it's just really great to be aware of the fact that there's a bunch of incumbents. If they're from older cohorts, they've gone through loads of iterations, they've got a bunch of legacy stuff, they've got some new stuff, um, they're looking to, to, to create hybrids and all of those kind of different ways of doing it. Each time, um, each constellation they have, there are loads of challenges and loads of opportunities for startups to wave a flag and say, hey, we're in this place. This is what we can help you with. This is what we can do. Um, and that that goes for um, companies like Byte, I think, to say, hey, here's a bunch of tools we're building you guys can use. But also, you know, you can, you know, look to work with AWS or you can look to work with a big incumbent, all those different areas. I think it's exciting times to look at this kind of uh, constantly reshaping kind of uh, constellations of, of, of what's possible. Um, again, all against the, 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 
the, the big job of making sure everything works and doesn't fall over. Um, and that's where Dave, Dave would, would come in. Um, but I, th I think there's a, just a big, big opportunity for, for incumbents and startups because of this joint kind of platform. They don't, you don't have to be in someone's premises or you know, not the door and press the flesh. You can say, hey, there's this big new environment and we can build a tool that connects here or we can build a business that can use APIs to connect with things. So the, the cloud metaphor and, and the cloud sort of paradigm just allows for more and more connections and, and, and more and more opportunities. Amazing. Those answers, top notch, both of you. So thank you so much. It's really helped us out. Uh, we've got another question that's come through. So we're working in the aerospace and defence industry. The big companies are still very reluctant to use cloud services. SMEs may be faster at picking new technologies and opportunities. What is your view on this? It's, it's very similar to the last one, isn't it, Stephen? You know, yeah. it's yeah. it's. I think there is a reluctance where security or privacy or anything else is part of it, but it doesn't mean that cloud can't be utilized. There's always things that you can use for cloud. Just pick your workloads, pick your opportunities, pick your battles, use it where it makes sense. Don't use it where it doesn't. I think for me, the biggest problem we've had in the IT industry as a whole over the last five years is this concept of businesses almost feeling forced to have a cloud first strategy. I hate the words. I absolutely hate them. The words we should be using is cloud appropriate. And I have seen businesses that formerly had a, an executive team in place five years ago that said, we're going to go cloud first. have spent the last 12 to 18 months pulling infrastructure back to on-premise because the sheer cost of running everything in cloud as their business changed over COVID made it completely prohibitive. And actually, sometimes it's better just to have a piece of tin with some bits of metal spinning in it sat in a rack somewhere because it's the cheapest way of doing something. So cloud appropriate is the phrase for me. Don't use it pointlessly. Don't don't feel that you have to use it. Use it where it adds value. Um, go on, Stephen. I don't know what you'd add to that. Yeah, no, it's, again, it's boringly. I <laughs> totally agree with you. Um, but I, th I think the, the, the question also had a, 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 an aspect, at least if, if I remember it correctly, of... of um, what could be gained from working with companies who are in the cloud and I, and, and again from a from a startup perspective i think there's just a mass opportunity so if you're a startup there surely is a good marketing blurb that says hey we know that um migrating to cloud is really really difficult uh we know there's a bunch of um trade-offs that are firmly placed within the on-prem um paradigm that say you should keep stuff there we can be your partner in the cloud to help you do xyz I mean, I know, you know, as parts of Barclays, correct me if I'm wrong, or, uh, you know, they still still use faxes, you know, <laughs> as part of their infrastructure. And, and, and there will be, there will be moments like that. But again, if, it, if it's not broke, then, then, you know, that's great. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, challenges can be met by, by doing things yourself. Um, I, I like to think of it this way. If, you, if you're an incumbent, regardless of industry, if you're a big incumbent with, with, with deep tentacles into the past of doing things in a certain way, I think you can either uh, build your own new stuff, you can uh, partner, you can acquire, you can invest. And it's basically just to go, look, um, building or, 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 or shifting across is not the, the, the first and best answer always. It's like the, the, it's the constellation of all the different parts that are, that, are, that are useful. So if you can engage with startups by partnering with them or investing in them or acquiring them, that that can be a way of, of of looking at these challenges too. That you, you don't have to, you know, just drag everything across and then you know uh, go at it afresh. It's it's a it's a big strategy question, um, and it's a big cultural question. Amazing, thank you. So probably moving on to our final question now, just over five minutes to go. Um, what are the biggest software and technology challenges facing startups? Um, obviously, we've got the cloud, which is a huge um, huge positive for our, the startups within our ecosystems. But what would you guys say is the, the biggest challenge for those startups in terms of the technology world? Do you, uh, do you want to go first this time, Stephen? Sure, cool, cool. I'll go first. Um, thanks, Dave. Um, look, I think um, technology challenges, I think I think the challenge really for a startup is they don't know what they don't know. So there's, there, there's a beautiful kind of environment that's being built by Microsoft and Amazon and Google, all these people uh, that are making, you know, the, 
gave rise to is what Dave said earlier. But back in the day, things were maybe more interesting because there was more. It was more ground up. Uh, now there's a bunch of super cool layers on top of things. Um, you know, words like DevOps and FinOps and all those kind of um, new terminologies where you can just use tools. If you look at Heroku or those kind of environments um, where, where technology is easier and easier um, for you to, to start off new things. I think the big problem is that because it's so easy, paradoxically, sometimes there's, an, there's people imagine that the journey will just, you know, be, be easy forever. But I think scaling, therefore, is the big is the big problem, the big challenge that if you start off with those environments, over time, just by necessity to become more and more complex and very quickly you need a, need a partner uh, to navigate those things with. I think that's the biggest challenge. I'd, I'd answer it very slightly differently. I agree with everything you said, Stephen. I, I think for me, if I were to be creating a business and creating a startup now, I think, I think the biggest challenge potentially for a business is there's so much choice. There are so many different ways of doing things. You could make a decision and rip the whole lot out and replace it with something 5% better in 12 months. I mean, you could literally spend your whole five-year yeah. startup IT budget every six to 12 months on different technology and end up chasing your tail. And, and I think when we're starting something up, there is this, this net new build, it's exciting. And, and people that do it successfully always have an instinct for what's right. You have to be very careful to not end up chasing your tail. It's like, it's exciting and it's new, but you need to pick something that has longevity. Otherwise you can end up wasting a lot of money by chasing latest and greatest all the time. So I think that for me is something is like making very, very educated and careful choices of what technology you choose to make sure it's got longevity and it will live sort of a three to five year cycle. Um, or I guess if you're doing a startup, live the cycle until somebody else buys you out and somebody else has to worry about replacing the, uh, the first generation of technology you put in your business. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Well, thank you both so, so much. I've learned a lot myself. It's been super insightful. Thank you to everybody for attending. Um, as we've mentioned at the beginning, um, this event is recorded, so please share it far and wide. Um, we'd love for, to get as many people as educated and view the event as possible because the content has been really insightful. Um, and thank you so much, Dave and Steve. You've been great. Um, we hope to see you all on the next event soon. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Jamie. Thank you.